Relive the Past, brought to you by Bianconetti YYZ, a Juventus official fan club in Toronto. I'm Rocco Fasano. June 9th, 1990, Rome. It's the 70th minute of Italy's home opener against Austria, and the game is deadlocked. Azzelo Vicini, the coach, turns to his bench and says, Warm up. Mister, ma sta parlando con me? Mister, are you talking to me? Si, tu, Toto. And just like that, the hero that we're going to talk about today makes his World Cup debut. A handful of seconds later, Donadoni passes the ball wide to Vialli, who from the byline crosses a perfect ball to Schillaci right on his head, puts the ball away, puts Italy ahead in what would be eventually the game winner. Just like that, overnight, our hero became Il Salvatore della Patria, the savior of the fatherland. But our story does not begin here. Palermo, early 1970s. Among the cement jungle of popular housing complexes, children use whatever open space they can find, old rags rolled up to make a ball, and two stones to be used as goalposts. Schillaci Salvatore, shortened to Totò, comes from a poor family with three siblings. My father, a mason, would struggle to bring a plate of pasta home for us to eat, Totò says. It's a special treat when his dad brings home a few cans of pop for the kids to share, even if it meant that each gets a small glass of it. Totò has a big passion, a passion that's bigger than his low economic status. Instead of getting involved in tomfoolery or committing petty crimes with some of his friends, he spends his childhood playing football in the piazzetta nearby. At night, he sneaks the ball in his bed. The kid doesn't have God-given dribbling or touch, but he can smell a goal and has tremendous finishing ability. He's a true opportunist. He signs his first contract as a professional for Messina aged 18. The team from Los Tretto beats rival Palermo to the punch, offering his club Amat only 7 million lira more. That's about 3,500 euro. At Messina, Schillaci stays humble, carrying the veteran players' bags. Slowly but surely, Toto gets his playing time, and after suffering two meniscus injuries, he becomes the team's goleador. 1988-89 is the pinnacle of his career in Sicily, under Zdenek Zeman, who relieves Schillaci's father figure, Franco Scoglio. Under Zeman's coaching, Known for employing hyper-offensive tactics, Schillaci scores a record 23 goals, which capitulated him atop the goal scorer's chart, getting the attention of many Serie A clubs. I wanted to leave before Zeman came. I heard that there was interest from Udinese and other Serie A clubs. I felt ready, but club management refused. Until one day they told me, you've been signed by Juventus. In the summer of 1989, Boniperti brings him to Torino for 6 billion lira, about 3 million euros. Juventus coach Dino Zoff is immediately convinced by his performances and Schillaci features in Juve's typical starting 11. In his first season at Juve, he scores 15 goals in 30 matches and is quickly renamed Toto Gol. In a blue-collar Juventus composed by Casiraghi, Alemi, Cervzavarov and Barros, Schillaci contributes decisively to an historic double winning the Coppa Italia and Coppa UEFA by beating Milan and Fiorentina respectively. His excellent season convinces Italian national team coach Azzelio Vicini to include him in the Azzurri squad for the upcoming World Cup, which is taking place in Italy that year. After scoring the game winner against Austria, Toto returns to the bench for the match against the United States. When he was subbed on again, Andrea Carnevale, who was being subbed off, made an eloquently rude gesture at Vicini that would mark the end of the Napoli striker's appearance in an Azzurri jersey. Mortem tua vita mea. Schillaci automatically becomes the starting striker for La Nazionale for the remainder of the tournament, scoring in all of the remaining matches. In fact, he breaks the deadlock against Czechoslovakia, Uruguay, Ireland, and in the semi-final lost in penalties against Argentina. In the third place final against England, Italy is awarded a penalty while the match was tied, 1-1. One, one. 
Baggio, the least penalty taker, gets close to Toto and says, take the penalty and win the golden boot. And so it was. Reflecting on that World Cup, Schillaci later said, not even a madman would have ever imagined what was about to happen to me. There are time periods in the life of a footballer in which everything comes as easy as breathing. For me, that magical state coincided with that World Cup. For me, that means that someone above decided that Totoski Lachi had to become the hero of Italy 1990. Schillaci returns to club action with a new Juventus, one with Gigi Maifredi at the helm, replacing the strong but taciturn Dino Zoff. Maifredi's modern ideas center on zone defending, inspired by revolutionary coaches like Zdenek Zeman, Nevio Scala and Enrico Sacchi. Roberto Baggio, his Azzurri striking partner, joined him at Juventus after a torrid transfer saga, which saw Boniperti tear Di Vincodino away from Florence for a record of 25 billion lira, that's about 12 and a half million euros. Schillaci and Baggio are an odd mix, however. Baggio likes to tease, while Toto is a serious guy who doesn't take too well to tomfoolery. Yet, they were often sharing the same sleeping quarters when the team would play in away matches. Robbie wouldn't speak much, Toto recalls, and I wouldn't speak at all. It's no surprise that the two of them have an odd rapport. During one of these overnight stays, Schillaci wakes up to some weird sounds coming from the bathroom and notices that Baggio wasn't in his bed. He knocks on the door to make sure that everything's okay and Baggio comes to the door to tell him that he was praying. <laughs> That's when Schillaci discovered Baggio was a Buddhist. Another time, the two forwards get into a spat. Some accounts talk about a headbutt, others of a punch. It was really silly. We were in the dressing room and Roberto was kidding around with me, Toto recalls. But his jokes became offensive, and I was already a nerd for my own reasons and reacted by hitting him. I regretted it immediately. Fortunately, the matter ended right there and then. Besides Baggio and Schillaci, the 1990-1991 Juventus is furnished with World Cup champions like Jurgen Kohler and Thomas Hassler and Andreas Müller, along with a rocky Brazilian defender Julio Cesar. The stage was set for champagne football and the return to the foremost domestic glory, Lo Scudetto. Alas, it wasn't so. My Freddy's football, the good side of it at least, is seen only on a desultory basis, and Juventus goes trophyless, recording the worst season in the preceding 28, and is unable to conquer a berth for any UEFA competition. Our hero falls victim to Maifredi's football, but also to the weight of the crown. After the World Cup, he said, I felt like a building had collapsed on my shoulders. Schillaci stays at Juventus for one more season, leaving in the summer of 1992, when the Bianconeri acquire Gianluca Vialli. His tally at Juventus is of 36 goals in 132 games in all competitions. After spending two seasons at Inter, he becomes the first Italian player to feature in Japan's J-League. Japan enriches Schillaci's life just as much as he enriches their football. With Jubilo Iwata, he would score 68 goals in 100 matches in all competitions over four seasons. Toto turned his modest roots to his favor and used them to push him forward. What he lacked in pure skill he made up for in his rapacious sense for goal. It was this humility and hunger that turned Toto into the people's champion. Toto currently has his own academy and works with the Juventus Legends project and has featured in some Juventus Legends games. Each one of us is smitten by a Juventus player whose career coincided with a particular time in our life or a particular victorious cycle in Juventus's history. It is because of them that Juventus is a legendary club that it is today. And it is because of that that it's important to relive the past.